Okay, hello and welcome everyone to the Landscape Conservation Design webinar series hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative, which is also known as the Desert LCC, and the University of Arizona School of Natural Resources and the Environment. My name is Matt Graybaugh. I'm the science coordinator for the Desert LCC. A brief background on the series. The series will provide a learning opportunity for Desert LCC partners interested in landscape scale conservation. Webinars in this series will highlight key components of landscape conservation design from prominent regional and national examples. These examples offer insights and lessons applicable to the three ongoing landscape conservation design efforts of the Desert LCC. These are the Eastern Mojave, the Madrean Watersheds, and the Dos Rios. We're very pleased to have Dr. Rua Mordecai uh, kick us off with the webinar today. Rue is the science coordinator for the South Atlantic Landscape Conservation Cooperative. His core focus is on the South Atlantic Conservation Blueprint, and this is a living spatial plan to conserve our lands and waters in the face of future threats like urbanization and climate change. Rue received his bachelor's degree from the University of Florida and a PhD from the University of Georgia. Before joining the South Atlantic LCC in 2010, he served as the Southeast U.S. Bird Monitoring Coordinator for Partners in Flight, which is a partnership of federal, state, nonprofit, and private organizations. So with that introduction, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Rua. And Rua, it's all yours. Awesome. Thanks, Matt, for that fancy introduction. Um, so what I was going to do is, just like in the title, talk a little bit about uh, selecting and using ecosystem indicators in the South Atlantic. Uh, just try to give you, you know, a flavor of, of uh, what's happened over time, some of the lessons we've learned, and how we've approached selecting and then constantly improving and using the ecosystem indicators. First, some quick orientation. Um, so South Atlantic LCC is right over there, that blue little 14 in the bottom right. So we, we kind of cover uh, parts of six states, and then we go 200 miles out to the ocean. So we've got um, plenty of fresh water and land and a lot of ocean that we, that we cover as a cooperative. I'm not going to give the introduction about what cooperatives are. I assume you all already know that piece. I'm going to dive right into what's going on in the South Atlantic. Before I even get into some of the history, I just wanted to give you a quick introduction of the overall sort of approach that we take as a cooperative, a sort of overall philosophy to everything. Um, and it fits into this um, lean startup framework. Uh, so. It'll look a lot like adaptive management to a number of you folks, the classic sort of cycle. Uh, but one of the big things that, that's different that, that we do as a cooperative is trying to really minimize that total time through the loop. So that's a, the different thing. Is we, we tend to move fast. We plan for how to fix things. But we're constantly iterating and moving forward quickly. Uh, this is the kind of approach that's really been hugely influential in businesses, uh, especially in the tech industry, especially in the last decade or so. This is the kind of approach that Uber and Facebook and Google and um, Instagram and those big tech um, folks have taken. And it originated back in the, the time of what's called lean manufacturing uh, in the auto industry when all the Japanese auto manufacturers were completely wrecking all the American auto manufacturers. Uh, this, this whole lean startup kind of approach they've taken was a big part of that. So that's kind of a central thread through everything we've been doing at the cooperative is is trying to sort of move fast and, and regularly iterate on everything we do. And that carries on to uh, the indicators themselves. All right, so let's start in the very beginning. Uh, so back in 2012, as, as a cooperative, we were fairly young and came up with this greater strategic plan of, OK, well, what's our niche? What do we want to do, do as, a, as a broader cooperative? So this is back early 2012. Um, and what does this all add up to that's different? And a cooperative came up with this, this three to five year mission to create the shared blueprint for conservation actions for natural and cultural resources. So you know we were going to do great things, but we really wanted some kind of shared blueprint for, for action. So, and then the goal was to try to do that in three to five years. There are really kind of three pieces to that thing, kind of fairly logical, right? OK, if you're going to have the shared blueprint, first you need some kind of indicators. You need some kind of measures of shared measures of success as a group. Pretty essential if you have a bunch of folks working together on things. Then we also wanted some kind of state of the South Atlantic. What are those indicators telling us about the ecosystem? How are we doing? And then this blueprint, this living spatial plan for, for how we're going to get the indicators and the condition we want them to be in. 
Uh, so that was generally the, the framework. And so early 2012, that's when we started in on, on kind of step one. Okay, well, we need some indicators. How do we, how do we pick them? What do they look like? And so we started in on, on figuring out our, our process. Uh, we, we started pretty, like we started a lot of our efforts uh, with this kind of big online feedback from our web community, trying to really tap into that expert knowledge and, and what people have already known. Uh, you know, using and developing indicators is a new thing. Uh, so the first thing we did, big broad survey out to everyone, and you know, what, what should your cooperative do and what shouldn't it do? That's kind of classic questions we're almost always asking. Um, so that helps you know, that helps down the whole process. It's like, well, what, do you, what should we do with indicators? What shouldn't they do for us? Um, then we started synthesizing existing information. What are people already in, using? And, and then got together a diverse team to sort of draft the process. So step one, what's the process for identifying um, um, all the various definitions and rules and pieces like that? So that's where we started basically with what do we, what do we already know, good advice from the broader community and kind of synthesizing what was already out there, and then put this team together to figure out what the process looked like. And the group, you know, mix of federal, state, private, nonprofit, classic kind of mixed group of folks, um, came up with these five components that they wanted uh, in, this, in this process. And the first one, of course, was definitions, right? I mean, you, you throw around all kinds of different words. And there's a million different meanings for different things. You know, what's an objective? What's an indicator? Or do we call them indicators? Do we call them priorities? What do we call them? Um, uh, some kind of framework that they fit in there, some kind of bigger objective framework. A uh, crosswalk of the existing indicators. Uh, some kind of criteria for selection, right? OK, well, how are we going to pick one indicator over another? Uh, and then some kind of timeline and approach. Uh, so those are the big core pieces that, that they want. I'm not going to go through all of those um, different different components of it, but if you have any questions about each of those later, um, I can I can talk about those. I'm just going to hit on a couple of things. Um, first, the, the highest level, the indicator framework, when we, when we talked about it, um, I realized we were really after two different types of, of um, things for indicators. The first on the natural resource side was the overall integrity of the ecosystem. There's a lot of good discussion about, about that within some individual broad ecosystem types, um, you know, things like our sort of prairie versus forest wetlands kind of thing. Um, and then and the idea was that we should really be going for ecosystem integrity. And then if that doesn't work, we may need to pay attention to some, some specific individual species um, that may not be covered through that. But in general, the approach was we need to go to integrity of natural resources. And let's use any possible metric are at our disposal. You know, it, they could be they could be species, they could be abiotic factors, they could be um, habitat metrics. You know, whatever best indicates the overall integrity of that ecosystem. And then the second part was integrity of cultural resources. So this is kind of how history and, and people fit into the landscape. And so we also wanted a series of um, indicators around the, the cultural landscapes and, and cultural components of indicators as well. Uh, so those are our broad two types. Um, there's there's more details in the hierarchy and some documents, and I'll I'll send you a link if you really want to go go deep. Um, but that was sort of the higher level thing folks wanted to get out of our indicators. And one big key thing coming out of this was our our criteria. Um, I would say especially if you're if you're selecting indicators, really thinking and having a strong set of of criteria for deciding, you know what indicators need to do and and how you pick between them uh, has been really, really important over the last last few years, and I'll hit on that in a little bit. But the broad type of things we came up with um, were put into these three kind of categories that were ecological criteria. Uh, so your sort of basic components of, well, they need to be able to respond to change. They need to be able to respond to conservation actions. Um, we need to be able to make them go up or down. Um, and another critical thing was, which was pretty funny because um, this didn't actually come up until a little bit later in the whole process, is that we need to actually, they need to indicate other things other than themselves. It was so obvious the group didn't actually even come up with it until a little bit uh, later on into the process, um, which is, okay, if you're an indicator, you need to indicate something other than yourself, other components of the ecosystem. Um, so that was the key criteria in there. And we had our 
our practical criteria, which was we needed to be able to model them based on existing information. We need to be able to monitor them with existing efforts. Uh, so those kind of practical pieces. And I would say that's probably, and, and y'all probably already sort of faced and looked at this in many ways, that's one of the big forks in the road, right, when you're, when you're picking metrics. There you want to focus on practical indicators that you can measure and monitor right now um, and, and kind of get to work using them, all, even though they may not be the most perfect indicators for the system. Or do you want to do more aspirational types of indicators, which is the other approach I see a lot, where people pick these indicators, um, but knowing that they can't quite measure them and monitor them at that point. And so then they go after trying to figure out how you do that. Uh, so that's kind of a key fork in the road. The South Atlantic, we tend to move pretty fast. And so our objectives in there were to try to get some things that we could immediately use um, that we could already monitor and we could already use as indicators. So that was the practical criteria. And those, in particular, were kind of the biggest red line uh, in, in deciding what indicators we were going to use and what we weren't. Because there's a lot of amazing indicators out there that you can use. There's a much smaller set that are easier to kind of model and are already monitored and, and can already be used. And the last thing we had was social criteria. So these were, this wasn't kind of a red line, must have, must not have, but they were bonus points, essentially, uh, which is things like how well do they resonate with uh, private land and water managers, public land and water managers, uh, the, the American public. Um, and so that was a bonus. You know, All things being equal, you want to pick something that, that resonates with a broad group of people. So, so that was our criteria. And interestingly, pretty much all of the different um, you know, kind of criteria and things under these categories we came up with, um, almost all of them came pretty close to word for word from the very beginning when we just asked the broad web community, what should we do and what shouldn't we do with our indicators? People, I can, you know, web community at that time, 2012, it was a few hundred people. Um, but a lot of the great kind of core criteria just came from people saying, don't pick an indicator that we can't monitor. Don't pick something you can't model now. You know, got to respond to change, those kind of things. Those came really early in the process. It was great. The team was able to just shape them into, into criteria. So that was the, the criteria, and those are the criteria we still, still use to this day, which is pretty cool. All right. Um, so we came up with our sort of draft process, components, pieces, um, and then our next step was going out to some workshops to have some conversations, review the process, share some lessons learned um, about the indicators. And this was really fun. We had them in a few locations in the geography, um, got some folks together to kind of look at the draft um, approach. And then also, I think probably the biggest highlight was we had folks from different partnerships and organizations talk about basically what worked well and what didn't work with with their use of indicators. So we had people from, um, we had people from nonprofits, state agencies, federal agencies, and bigger partnerships um, like uh, sort of fish habitat partnerships and bird joint ventures and estuarine partnerships, um, and folks from involved in Everglades restoration and Chesapeake Bay, you know, that were, you know, decades in front of us as far as trying to use indicators. And that was really, really helpful because that helped bound some key components and key messages in our process. And coming out of that, some of the key things were pick the smallest number of indicators you possibly can. And that was one. Don't go too big because it's very, very hard to reduce them. Uh, and then the second thing that came out, which is kind of related, which was basically try to revise your indicators quickly. So it's because it's hard once you pick some indicators to then take them away when you learn that they don't work. One of the big lessons, um, this came particularly from the Forest Service, Everglades Restoration, a um, few other sources, Chesapeake too, um, they'd run into the situation where they'd gone and they'd pick these indicators, learned later that they didn't work very well, but then it was too late to fix them. You know, they waited years and they'd been so invested and everyone was so invested in it and it was such a, had such process. Um, that it was really difficult. Um, they had one indicator for ginseng that, uh, in the mountains, which is a great indicator in the mountains, except for the problem is people love to illegally harvest ginseng. And so you could have a beautiful forest with no ginseng, but it's just because people went and stole all your ginseng. So that's a classic example that ended up being an indicator, but 
by the time they realize it didn't work well, it's too late for them to get out of the process. So lots of good lessons learned from that, um, lots of good conversations. And so we took all that sort of feedback, folded that into the, the process and the rules we did, and um, then approved the, the process that we went through. So here's our, this is, now we're kind of late into 2012. Um, and I include more detail than I normally would in this, um, just because it sounds like there's a lot of people wrestling with the process. So I'll show you in general how we did it in the first cut through the process. This is kind of the beginning in November. Um, we had three kind of major types of groups that were working. Uh, we had the broader, what we called the, the LCC community, which was kind of anyone and everyone on the web community that was interested. In. And we had our tighter selection and revision teams. These were kind of selected. Uh, particularly reviewed and recommended from the steering committee, um, our cooperative. And so that's why they're sort of color-coded. So this light blue is the teams in the middle, and then the other sides are basically groups that are kind of providing input outside of those teams. So once we got the process, everyone was good with it, we moved forward. And so this is kind of the next more complicated step. But a key thing that we did that was different from most everything else I've seen is that we had two teams working at the same time. One was the obvious one, okay, select our first round of indicators, you know, select them. And the second one was we called our revision team. And so they were developing the process, so this is the bottom blue box here, to test and revise the indicator selection. So even before we had picked our indicators, we were figuring out, well, how are you going to make sure they work and how are we going to fix them? Um, because you know the first version of everything is full of problems. No matter how long you take, no matter how perfect, first version is always full of problems. So let's figure out how to fix it um, before we even get to that first version. Uh, so that was something a little novel that we did that worked really well. Um, and then so the selection team went through, looked at key indicators that weren't already in the synthesis of plans, so I'm at this sort of top blue area here. Um, and most of what they're doing is, is kind of working together as a small group and then getting feedback from uh, broader committees and the, and the broader partnership. Um, they got some feedback through online surveys and reviews, and then basically just went and did scoring of the different indicators based on the, the criteria that I showed before. So I went through, um, you know, the selection team is going through its scoring stuff, where at the same time, there's a team figuring out how we're going to test and fix those indicators based on the criteria. That was something that was a little bit different about, about our process, which has worked, set us up really nicely. And then basically into February and March, they, they went and selected the first round of indicators, figured out what the revision process would be, sent it to our steering committee, and the final decision was back in March. Um, so now we've got basically from about a year before that when the steering, we had the approved strategic plan to have figuring out our process and then actually having our first round of indicators approved in 2013. So that's where we were at in 2013. We were all excited. Yay, we've got these great criteria. Um, we did our best to figure out how well we had our best guesses on how easy they were going to be to model and monitor based on existing information. Uh, yay, hooray, we had something to start on. Then we want to take the next step. All right, well, let's do our state of the South Atlantic. We, got all, we picked all these great indicators. We went through the great criteria process. Let's go see what they're telling us about the system. And for some indicators, we could do it pretty well. So impervious surface, this is a classic one of our freshwater product target. We could do cool things like look at, in this case, on the x-axis, that sort of year going from the past into the future. And then on the y, it's sort of number of catchments with less than 10% impervious surface. And we had a target of what we were shooting for. Um, that target was not realistic <laughs> based on our forecast. Um, so some things we could actually model across the whole geography. We could do past, present, and future. It was great. Uh, but a lot of the stuff we realized, holy crap, we, we can't model these things. And these are a lot harder than we thought they would be. So that was a nice early, early lesson in how hard it is to actually depict, especially depict these things spatially, get the models. Um, so some of the things we thought, yeah, sure, we'll be able to model these. Ooh, maybe not. So we still move forward, though. Um, so our, our goal of kind of eventually get creating that blueprint three to five years, 
Uh, so we moved forward using some of the indicators that we had and went for our first kind of cut at our spatially explicit LCD Blueprint 1.0. Um, you know, part a lot of had to rely a lot on expert knowledge and existing plans and some of the indicators to come from our first spatial prioritization, basically picking, this was kind of sub-watershed level, uh, picking what types of actions needed to happen where and prioritizing them. So I move forward, um, but that was really a good starting point to figure out how we're going to use the indicators. And after seeing 1.0, people said, OK, I see where this is going. I'd really like to see it be completely data-driven and really like to see it driven by the, you know, all the indicators. Um, but now I see where the blueprint's going. So after we had that, that first version, that was, the, that was the gap to say, all right, well, now we need to go through and make sure test, revise, clean up all of our indicators, make sure we can model them all, make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so that's basically what we did after Blueprint 1. So now into leading up to late 2015, we basically went through and made sure all of our indicators, that we could model them all, um, depict them spatially across our geography. And then um, and we ran into a number of things that didn't work. And when they didn't work, we booted them out and then fixed them. Uh, my favorite example of, of an indicator that, that failed the testing, which seemed like such a no-brainer indicator when we picked it, uh, was sea turtle nesting density. Um, so that was kind of, that was one of those, yeah, of, of course, right? You know, this is going to be a great indicator of beach health and nest predator communities. And so we thought, yeah, OK, sea turtle nesting density, that's going to be great. Then we set it up against some other things that we expected to kind of relate pretty strongly, especially things like beach birds and other species that are pretty sensitive to the same nest predators and disturbance. We saw the opposite of the relationships we thought we would see, this sort of negative relationship where they were like, wow, when there were less sea turtles, there were more beach birds and more beach birds, less sea turtle density. So as we were looking at that, like, oh, OK, this is something, something's going on. And then when we dug into the data and looked, what we found is that in a few of the states, sea turtles, especially the nests, are so heavily managed in a few of the states. And so almost all of the nests had predator guards around the nests, or the nests were dug up and moved. I mean, it was like to the level of you could imagine there's kind of like machine gun nests and you know people guarding them as much as possible. And so what happened was a few other things about sea turtles as well, combined with this heavy, heavy species-specific management for sea turtle nests, that really the sea turtle nesting density was only really telling us about sea turtle nests. And it wasn't really telling us about the overall health of the beach or how everything else was doing. Uh, so that, that was uh, my favorite example of indicators we actually, through testing, ended up removing. And we brought this to a bigger team, state, federal, you know, biologists across the geography laid all this out there, like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. But you know, in hindsight, <laughs> once they tested and looked at it, uh, so everyone was good with removing that one as, a, as an indicator. But it was a good example of why it's important to actually go back and look and make sure indicators are doing what they, you think they would do. So cool. We got revised indicators at that point. We actually had them all modeled and measured. And then we started getting to do the really fun stuff with it. As I mentioned, I was going to talk a little bit about using the indicators. So then we got to move on to the state of the South Atlantic that we really wanted to do. And so this is our first cut at it in 2015. Um, and so it covers basically ecosystem health scores for all our different subregions and different ecosystems. And it's completely dri data driven, completely off the indicators themselves. So all the scores are based on percent of the landscape in good condition. The first page is more of the subregions, just looking at the subregions of our geography and how they're doing. And then here's an example page from a uh, forested wetlands. So you see kind of the scores based on the subregions, kind of graded to see scores for each of the indicators, the overall sort of conceptual diagram visually about what the ecosystem looks like, and then a nice little story at the bottom. Another fun thing we got to do is we, we have these little confidence bars that are like cell phone reception signals. Uh, so those are pretty qualitative, but it was sort of how confident are we in that score given the input data for the indicators and all those things. Uh, so that was, that was really nice. That was a, a nice product we were able to do once we had all our indicator 
modeled and then and put together in a nice uh, compelling package to see how the, the ecosystems were done. And then we got to move on to version two of the blueprint. So this was back in 2015, so late 2015. Um, and so here we finally got to use the indicators um, very specific way in our in our overall design. Uh, so within each of the ecosystems, we have a series of, of indicators um, for each of them. And so we use a program called Donation to identify you know, where are the highest priority places to maintain integrity across all those indicators in the ecosystems. Then we combine them all together. We use a program called Linkage Mapper, we use connectivity in the corridors, and then get to the blueprint priorities. Now, I wasn't going to talk about all the details of, of um, the spatial design and all that components, because I know that's going to be in later um, webinars. But I just kind of wanted to highlight the fact that these indicators now propagate everything else we do, all our sort of measures of success, data path length, the blueprint, there are kind of are we getting where we need to go measures. Then we had version 2.0, the sort of darkest areas are um, the highest priority for shared conservation action. This was within blueprint 2.0, including sort of corridors and, and other components. So this is, again, completely indicator driven. And then at that point, it's been about three years since we had our, our strategic plan. And then we got to update our mission, because after version two, you know, being data driven, have, connecting to all the indicators, it was like, all right, well, great. Our three to five year mission was paid if we print. It's three years. We got one. Now it's time for the next step. So that's when we focused more on facilitating the conservation action guided by the shared adaptive blueprint. So now it's more operational. Let's start using the indicators, the state of the South Atlantic, and the blueprint um, more heavily for bringing the new conservation dollars and you know incorporation to organizational policies and all those various components. Um, this, basically, the steering committee, the South Atlantic, wants this blueprint to be the gold standard for conservation of it in this region. So yay, we've got an updated mission. Um, so we want to start now using all these things to change stuff on the ground. I wanted to do that before and was working on it, but now it's um, even even better foundation for that. But then we got to start using the blueprint um, for or the indicators for a few um, newer things that we hadn't really gotten to do uh, before. And one of the big opportunities to start exploring this was some uh, new funds from the Department of Interior Wild and Fire Resilient Landscapes. Um, so this was kind of, you know, this was my Congress for the from the National Species of Wild and Fire Strategy. They wanted to support big, large collaboration for big impacts. And the big thing they wanted was metrics beyond just treated acres, right? And almost, especially nowadays, so many of these programs, so many of these proposals are all about quantitative metrics. You know, how did this action contribute? What's my return on investment? What are your metrics? What are your indicators? Um, and so this is a great opportunity. Um, to go and work together on, on putting together a proposal and using the blueprint data of South Atlantic these indicators um, to basically as a foundation for metrics beyond treated acres. And so we actually got um, you know, the funded proposal for the for the South Atlantic. Um, got, gotten almost two million dollars so far for, for prescribed fire. Um, and a lot of the competitiveness and the overall proposal was pretty much wrapped around the indicators, the blueprint, data of the South Atlantic um, kind of metrics. So this was, a, I would say, as a cooperative, our first big win, the only one funded in the eastern US, um, for showing how putting all these things together could potentially bring in some new conservation dollars that wouldn't already be here without it. Um, so that was, that was pretty exciting. And it's also been a good opportunity to start thinking about how we can use these indicators um, to predict return on investment from new conservation funds. Uh, so that was a big key thing. So this was our, our first cut back in, in 2015 when we were reporting on some of the funds and, and what they helped out with in the, in the geography. So we had here some areas where we had spatial fire extent data in our geography. And what we did was we used this scoring system we did in the state of South Atlantic for the indicators. So we have our pine and prairie indicators. This is where a lot of the fire is going, right? And so we have our pine and prairie bird index. That's one of them, Bob white quail, and sparrow, red-cockaded woodpecker. We have regularly burned habitat. Um, so we had some things that 
very much immediately responded to additional prescribed fire and some things like ro low road density areas and other metrics that didn't respond necessarily to that. Um, and so for each of them, this is the way it works in the state of the South Atlantic, each of them sort of get their indicator score based on how much is in good condition. And then you merge them together into an overall score. Um, so you know, you, you're getting Bs and Cs and Ds, and then you end up with a C in the middle or something like that. Uh, so it's all quantitative, um, and then you add it up to these, these bigger scores. And so we can start doing stuff um, like looking at the impact of the prescribed fire that was funded through the program, right? So um, now obviously we do this for all the pixels across the whole geography or all the different fire treatments. But for a simple example, let's say you're, you're the parcel you're on right now, you know, it starts off from the pine and prairie bird perspective. Um, you know, it's got just frog white quail on it. It's got regularly burned habitat, um, but not quite enough to bring in some of the other species. And it's in a low road density area. After prescribed fire, OK, well, now, now that we have more regular fire, we can bring in, um, we've got an additional species from the prairie bird index. We still are working on very cockaded woodpeckers. Um, you still have regularly burned habitat. And same thing with low road density. All right, well, now, what, what would happen without the fire? What if we didn't have enough money to regularly burn that habitat? OK, well, we've lost pretty much all our pine and prairie birds. We lost our regularly burned habitat. Uh, but some things don't change, like low road density. Um, so this gave us an opportunity to start moving and, and predicting, well, OK, how, how is different levels of investment going to help raise the bar with the different indicators? So this is our predicted impact of prescribed fire in those areas. The sort of previous condition was a B, A minus after the fire, predicted without fire, an F. Uh, these systems need regular fire. They're completely hammered. Um, so that framework was really, really, um, it, was, it was helpful in kind of reporting back and generating buzz on the program, but also helpful for us as a cooperative to start thinking about, um, you know, have some more tangible examples of how we're going to want to connect different actions to, to indicators. Bottom left, you can see these are the 2016 Resilient Landscape Collaborative South Atlantic, kind of the only one in the East around Long Leaf Pine. Uh, so this is actually, it's, it's a good example of something that we, I would say, especially in the beginning, we underestimated how important it was to be able to model the impact of conservation action on our indicators. Uh, you know, when we went through, we knew it was important. I mean, they needed to be able to respond to conservation action. Um, that was a key thing. Um, but what's really, especially more recently, so much of what we've been doing now has been, you know, okay, how does this action fit in? How does it contribute to a larger, um, the larger landscape? And a lot of that really is around taking management practices um, and and taking things like economic incentives and then translating. Well, okay, what does that look like? How is that going to change the indicators? How is that going to move the ball forward? Um, so we've been doing that a lot. That's kind of a lot of the bread and butter of how we've been kind of generating new resources uh, for conservation in this region. Uh, so it's, it's pretty exciting as an indicator use, but uh, there are still a number of our indicators that we can't quite predict the impacts of conservation action on um, just yet, just the way we formulated them. So that's been a good lesson learned about how important that being able to do that is. All right, uh, so that was the impact of prescribed fire. Um, so that's just one example of, of trying to use these indicators in practice. Uh, and then basically what we've been doing is now we're on this yearly update cycle. Uh, so every, um, every year we go through a process of we, we kind of test and revise the indicators as there's new data available. Suddenly now it's you know, made that you reach the practical criteria of, of being available, then we have a chance to fold it back in if it's a key missing gap. Or we, we keep testing them and we learn that it's not working as well as, as we think. So we've been kind of iteratively now every year testing or revising indicators, making them better. And then every year we update the blueprint at this point. Uh, so we are very close to, you know, we're very close to a draft probably end of this week of version 2.2 of the blueprint. That's going to be going out to workshops um, over the next couple months. And you don't see it on here, but in 2018, we're due up for another NC State of the South Atlantic um, report as well, where we're going to try to capture some trends over time in addition to just the current state. So that's basically where we're at. We've really been now going from trying to do all this big stuff to just making everything better 
and then focusing more and more on trying to use these products um, to, to help change the landscape. A few lessons learned. I would say I, I kind of picked three that, that came up the most for me. Uh, the first one, modeling indicators is hard, <laughs> very hard. Uh, we, we thought it was going to be, I mean, we didn't think it was going to be a cakewalk, but it was a little harder than we had thought it was going to be. Um, but it's okay. We, we you know move forward and keep getting them better and better, but it's definitely a significant amount of work. Uh, the second one would be moving fast in the way we've been doing, and it kind of I could put fast in air quotes because, you know, for a, for a tech company or for a business, we're not moving fast. But for a big landscape scale partnership, you know, where you've got, in this case, like with the blueprint, you know, we're at almost 400, or almost 500 people actively involved in, you know, some kind of fingerprint somewhere on developing, making decisions um, from over 100 organizations. Um, so for that, moving fast, you know, by doing this stuff every year while still being inclusive, um, you know, kind of giving everyone a chance to be part of it, and then documenting where things are not perfect, documenting known issues is something we do with all our indicators. Um, just, you know, hey, they're not perfect, and here's where they aren't perfect. Uh, that really helps. It's helped us build trust a lot in this area. Um, a lot of people spend, you know, a ton of time in partnerships and don't see anything tangible come or even see changes from their uh, inclusion. So being able to sort of rapidly improve and churn out things that are usable since people are making decisions every day. Um, you know, turning out things that are usable and then giving people a, a chance to keep making them better um, has been really helpful. Um, starts getting into a, a, a cadence and you can start delivering on, on what you're saying. Uh, and then the last one has been, I would say this, that indicators are powerful tools for bringing in new conservation dollars. I mean, when you're thinking about national funds, when you're thinking about a lot of these sources, um, I see it more and more that focused on quantification and what are your metrics and how do you do them. Uh, so I think that's, that's been a real big lesson learned about how important that is and how powerful it can be in, in kind of communicating why something you're proposing is important. Uh, and with that, I just wanted to um, kind of say if you want to learn more about any of this stuff, I hit a lot of stuff at a high level. Um, there's a, a whole bunch of write-ups various documents, details, timelines, and stuff like that uh, at this website over here, the sort of indicators roadmap where we have um, all our different testing documents on how we've tested them, our process, um, and all kinds of other stuff about the history and, and what, what's worked well and what So that was a rapid tour into the South Atlantic indicator approach and kind of the history and where we're at right now. And yeah, hopefully I left enough time for for plenty of questions or, or things that you're, you're wrestling with. Okay. Thank you very much, Rua. Um, hopefully you guys can hear me again. Um, I want to say I think this is a great presentation and, again, directly relevant for lots of things we're working on. Um, and you hit a bunch of key things uh, for me and for all of us to think about, I think. Um, we do have a good amount of time for questions. Um, because we're in lecture mode, we have two different options here for asking questions. So if you are connected to audio through your phone, uh, we ask that you please just enter your questions in the chat box in Adobe Connect. Hopefully you can see that. If not, um, let me know. If you are connected to the audio directly through your computer, um, you can still enter the questions in the chat box if you'd like, or you can raise your hand um, and we can unmute you to ask questions. So to unmute yourself, click the Participants tab and then hit the Raise Hand button at the bottom and we'll um, cycle through those questions as they come up. Um, I wanted to go ahead and kick, off, kick it off with a quick question here. Um, I'm especially inter interested in the cross-ecosystem integrity piece, Rua, um, mm -hmm. that you had in the flowchart. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you could talk just really quickly about uh, what kinds of things you're looking at for the cross ecosystem integrity? Yeah, so we had what we did is we had two different types of indicators. We had um, specific ecosystem indicators. You know, there's sort of unique things about each indicator. But then we had these indicators that were landscapes and waterscapes indicators, um, and so they were ones that cut across the different ecosystems. Rather, so water was things that were kind of mountains to the sea, and then landscapes were the terrestrial. Um, and so that was, um, so those were what's 
kind of stitched everything together, that and the connectivity analysis. Uh, so there are just some things that are kind of cross-ecosystem, broader patch size metrics and, and other components. And so that's how we dealt with the cross, that sort of balance of ecosystem specific, but then also having measures and metrics that cut across ecosystems. OK, great. That's, that's helpful. Um, so we have several questions coming through in the chat box. I'll go ahead and start there. Um, so the first um, comes from Genevieve Johnson, who's the, the Desert LCC coordinator. And her question is, how did you define or choose your revision and selection team as you were going through the indicator selection process? Yeah, so what we, what we did for that team, I could, okay, let's take them up who was on there. Basically, our approach for that was we wanted to get a diversity of organizations and ecosystem-specific expertise. Uh, so the goal was to try to say, all right, we, we want to do this kind of crosswalking of, of people that know about these ecosystems, but also can, can provide that sort of, you know, make sure you had folks from different nonprofits, folks from different sort of state federal agencies, folks from different uh, ecosystems. Uh, so we, we had, that was our kind of ultimate objective. And what we did was we, we started by you know, going to the steering committee and saying, okay, well, you know, who, this is the kind of expertise we're looking for. You know, who from your organization do you want to have there? And so sometimes we have one or two, sometimes we have three, four, or even, you know, five people um, that had different expertise. Uh, and then what we did from there is had some other people that may not have been from organizations that weren't even on the steering committee or would fill key gaps. And so then we went back to the group and then recommended them um, particular individuals that would fill uh, expertise gaps. So we want to make sure that, that you had at least somebody that knew something about each of the ecosystems and, it, and some broad representation of different types of organizations. So that was, that was how we set that up. It was really, you know, let the steering committee organizations have people they trusted, then fill in um, gaps in expertise from other organizations or other people, then recommend it back to them, and then they kind of gave it the thumbs up um, for that group. So that's how we, that's how we did this. Okay, can you give us a, a sense for overall, like how many people were involved in like the key selection and review team? Uh, they were, ooh, that's a good, um, I'm going to around, I can find the exact number here. Um, I think it was about 20 or so. Let me go find this out. Uh, it's been so long since we had that, so, you know, the original selection and review team <laughs> group with some of these numbers. Yeah, and it's not, I, I mean, we remember. can come back to that too, and it's not, uh, doesn't have to be specific. Just general notes, was it five or was it Yeah. Two? Yeah, so here's our individual selection. This is always how to find the different pieces. Um, so this is, let's see who developed. This is our original. Um, so this was the folks who developed the process, the indicator vision process, which is what, 10, 15, about 20. Oh, that was a pretty big gap. Um, this was on the, the process side, and then we, most of the week, you know, other than a few tweaks of adding a few other individuals, um, it was a, it was around 20 some odd folks for the indicator selection as well. Um, and you can see sort of a mix of different sort of partnership folks and different agencies and organizations, um, really just for their experience in the different systems. Um, but what we've done since then, so for the original selection, that's what we've done. But when we do, one of the big things that we do for the testing and revision is we then kind of go ecosystem by ecosystem and then throw the teams open to anyone that wants to be part of them. Uh, so the formalized teams, uh, sort of formalized indicator teams, were the ones that kind of got the process and the indicators together. And then particularly what we realized is that, you know, for improving the indicators, you need a pretty deep bench of specialized expertise. And so then for the revisions, you get, um, then we'd open them up to a broader group of people. I think so for the revision process, the first round of the revision process, we had 52 different people that were involved in, in, in sort of decision making on that. OK. Well, that sounds good. So this is like the core team that came up with uh, proposed mm -hmm. indicators and then got larger review. Yeah, exactly. So that's the classic sort of you know big review, um, small team to work on stuff, big review. And then now, anytime, like when we're developing a new indicator, um, we throw it open to, so sometimes depending on the interest in the indicator, you know, I think when we were doing some of our freshwater folks, we had just for 
just for a couple indicators, we had like 30 different people on the team. But then for our seabird indicator, where there's a lot less expertise, we had more like nine folks on that team. So it just depends on how deep the bench is for <laughs> folks in the region. Right. Now, that's awesome. Very helpful. Thanks. Um, so I need to start addressing some other questions here. Um, so a question from Nefer Wilkening is, were there any indicators that stakeholders really wanted that you weren't able to model? And if so, how did you communicate to stakeholders that you couldn't use their indicators? Oh, yeah. So that was great. That was why the criteria was so helpful. Um, you know, come in with the process ahead of time, uh, because there's just so many awesome things that would be awesome indicators. I mean, you probably can think of a ton for the system you're working in. Um, yeah, I mean, we have all kinds of great ones, like, you know, diatoms for freshwater aquatic quality, which would be fantastic. I mean, no one's monitoring them, um, and it would be doable, but oh, it would be it would be great. Um, yeah, there's, there's just a, a ton of ones that people came up with. In fact, usually when we ask people to think about, if you took a step back and said, what would you use as an indicator, most of what people come up with are not what's already being monitored. <laughs> um, but, but that was really where the criteria helped, because, okay, we already have these criteria, so you, you now narrow down you know, the potential indicators by quite a bit of saying, well, can we, can we model it right now across the entire geography? Um, and so, uh, if, but if we couldn't, the, so the way we've dealt with that sort of greater thing is, you know, maybe let's say there's something you really care about, but you don't, um, we, we can't use it as an indicator because it's not, you know, we don't have information or data or can't model across the whole geography. Uh, then that's what we deal with in our sort of uh, testing and revision process where we say, okay, well, let's take some data from some of these places where we can do it and then see how well the indicator works. Like, is your, is your metric covered um, with this indicator, or is it a key missing gap? Uh, so that's one thing that, that's helped a lot is sort of, um, you know, seeing whether the indicators, in a lot of cases, they work fairly well on some other things. Um, I can pull up, uh, well, I can pull up if there's time, uh, some examples where we did sort of fish communities and benthic invertebrates in our freshwater aquatic indicators. And so we took the GIS models and then did point level, tested them on point level sampling data throughout the geography to show that, oh, actually, they're, they're working fairly well. Um, and the other thing, too, is that because we have these criteria and this regular revision process, the door is always open if data are available. Uh, so um, the, the marine bird example I gave before, um, you know, folks thought that would actually be really great for looking at productivity hotspots and forage fish out, out in the ocean. But until basically three months ago, uh, there really there weren't sufficient data to have marine birds as an indicator in our marine ecosystem. Um, and we were short an indicator um, because of some of the testing and revision we did before. So we only have so many we can have for ecosystem. Uh, and so, yeah, this cycle we were able to, like, oh, there's new data. So it's not a complicated decision. It's, you know, we have this criteria. So it's not my personal decision. It's not a squishy area. Until it meets these criteria, um, it can't be in. But once it does, yeah, all right, then we can, then we can talk about it. Yeah. Cool. That makes sense. And actually, I think that ties into a couple questions that I'm going to try to combine here. Uh, so folks, feel free to put in additional comments if I don't, don't address this correctly. But we have a, a comment that I'm going to combine from Amanda Webb and Mo Carell um, talking about the indicators on the ground. So the, the first question is, was there any ground truthing of the modeled indicators, which you kind of touched on just now? And then a uh, Related question, I believe, is if so, who helped with testing the indicators in the field? Mm, yeah. Um, so actually, so I, can, I can pull up since I just had this up. Um, so we have in that roadmap the link that I sent before. Um, we have some of our criteria testing up here linked. Uh, so the, the first round of testing um, on, so most, I would say most of our validation of our, our models uh, is point level monitoring data, uh, but generally they're sort of already collected by other organizations. You know, we use data from we use data from Natural Heritage, we use data from um, some EPA assessments, from other state assessments. We kind of grab the data wherever we can, but that's kind of the ultimate, you know, the ultimate benchmark of like, yeah, you got all these great kinds of GIS models, but do they actually work when all these errors are compounded? Do they actually work in practice once you get down to like actual point level sampling? Um, so the, the first year we actually um, had some folks from NatureServe and NC State do the testing, um, doing it over across a lot. So this is sort of the, 
the 2014 to 2015 indicator testing that's linked up on the website. Um, so that was a lot of heritage data. Um, and then there's a few other GIS layers uh, in that part. And so that was where we actually did some of these testings of, of different metrics and how well they worked. Uh, and then the moving onward now, like for instance, the last year's testing was stuff that um, indicator testing was stuff that I did. Uh, so we've been doing that as staff and kind of folding it into the indicator process itself. So as you're developing and, and testing indicators, you go through and then and we kind of have a process for doing that. So we've been doing that uh, in-house. And so these are just a few of the examples. Um, and so this is just some of the, the documentation of us testing the indicators itself. So this is some of the data we use from the EPA Rivers and Streams Assessment to look at fish and, and benthic index. So point level sampling, then we go through, and then we actually test it um, based on the different conditions. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's mostly mostly point level stuff, and we get it from, from sort of various places. And now at this point, I'm the one that does a lot of the testing, but it's fun. Okay. Great. Um, we're going to go ahead and jump to the next question here, um, which I believe is from Larry Fisher from the U of A. And the question is, can you give us a sense for the total number of indicators and how they might break down in terms of categories? And Larry, I might yeah. have asked to clarify what you mean by, by categories here. Um, and then I guess I'll give you a two-part question. Real, hopefully this isn't mm -hmm. too much for you, but um, then the second part is, you mentioned that you're reviewing the results on an annual basis. So the question is, how are results shared and discussed among partners, used in decision making, and how are they shared with the wider public? Yeah, so um, at this point, I'll start with the number and then go to the annual basis and how results are shared. Uh, so um, this is sort of here is the list of the current indicators. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's usually 30 or less indicators for each ecosystem. Um, and they're a what, what happens is our cultural and natural resource indicators um, are uh, mixed together at an ecosystem level. And because that was a key thing with a lot of the cultural resource professionals um, and in the discussions was they didn't want the, the sort of natural and cultural, um, because of those connections, they felt like it would be important to have them coupled together. Um, so we have a number of issues where, you know, at the landscape level or any ecosystems, uh, so our low urban historic landscapes, one of our cultural indicators is a landscapes indicator. It drapes across all the systems. Uh, so this is about where here's our here's all our current indicators, and actually probably in a few weeks there'll be a new marine mammal indicator in there. Um, so that's that's about your sort of level of indicators. We tried to keep it for ecosystem specific, as you can see, um, at least for natural resources indicators, a maximum of three per ecosystem. And then a few of these, then there's like three landscapes, um, three waterscapes maximum uh, per ecosystem. Uh, so when we're able to add, because in some cases we only have two that work really well. So that's about the level number. Um, and how we communicate that, uh, generally what we do when we're, if we're going to, not generally, always, uh, if we're going to be updating or improving an indicator, uh, we send that out through our, um, out to our larger web community, it goes out in the newsletter, you know, hey, anyone want to be, you know, we're going to be updating, improving this indicator. Anyone want to join the team? Basically, everyone gets a chance to be part of that group. If you're part of the group and you're interested, then you get to be in more specific discussions. It's all consensus driven, so then you get to be part of the decision of whether that, that revision is good enough. And then we kind of keep everyone updated through the, um, the broader community. So it goes out to the newsletter, OK, now this is updated. Here's the improvements, um, all that other stuff. Uh, so it kind of happens in, in dynamically spun off groups for each indicator. Then people find out about it through the, through the newsletter. And sometimes there are specific individuals, if we're missing their expertise or might not get that, that we'll invite separately. Um, really communicating with the public, we haven't really been doing a lot of that because our biggest focus is more on the conservation community, um, conservation professionals. Um, the closest we have is that state of the South Atlantic that I was showing before, um, which is actually written in a way that um, is consumable by the general, uh, kind of try to keep it in plain language, make it very accessible. Um, and it has been actually used by some folks at a pretty broad, a broad level. Um, 
And yeah, so that's, that's been more of the forum. And the other component, which is pretty fun that I didn't talk about, is that we also tested um, how well the different types of indicators resonate with the American public through some stratified sampling, um, some folks at Duke, so this is the, the social criteria testing. Um, the big thing we were going after was this question of, well, what types of indicators are going to resonate most and what kind of knowledge do people have of the indicators? Uh, so they actually went in and, and hit people across a broad sort of socioeconomic spectrum and evaluated sort of willingness to pay and, and looking at these trade-offs of, you know, would you rather pay for beach health or, you know, have, you know uh, sea turtles or that, those kind of questions. Um, so that was a fairly interesting assessment. And also we went and looked at sort of public knowledge of, of, uh, of general terms like ecosystem, which if you look at the national stuff that TNC says, ecosystem, don't use it, people don't understand it. Um, but a huge majority of people across, at least in our South Atlantic region, um, were familiar with that term. So, you know, some regional differences in, in what some of the, the surveys say. Did I hit everything? Did I forget anything? Okay. I think that was good. And question. I might have missed this, so apologies. Um, but Larry asked a question, um, a follow-up question. Is the Duke study on the South Atlantic website? Yeah. That's the, so you're talking about the, the American public one? Yeah. That Duke study? Yeah, that's, that's, that's right here. It's under, and, the, and that link that I have on the, um, on the slides, that sort of indicator roadmap uh, piece, if you go under social criteria testing and read the results of testing how well indicators resonate. And that was kind of, that wasn't a huge epic study. We actually had a, a the survey design class of some graduate students go in and, and do that. Those are nice contributions are cooperative. We've got some good relationships with Duke and a few of the universities, and so we have got get grad students doing projects that are part of the cooperative, uh, which is fun. So that was really useful. There's been some follow-ups from that too. Great. Okay, well, I don't see any other pending questions right now. We're bumping up on the end of time here. Um, Actually, so uh, good point here. One follow-up question I, I'm not sure if we actually touched on before. We'll answer this in the last minute here, Rua, hopefully. Um, the, um, the question was getting back to ground truthing of indicators. I wasn't sure mm -hmm. if you specifically talked about ground truthing or did you just analyze data that were made available? Hmm. Oh, so you mean ground truthing, so it's sort of like are the indicators like actually going specifically proactively to some places to see if the indicators um, are in the condition they say they are. Um, so we haven't done we haven't done that. All of our all of our ground treating has been based on existing data that are collected. But but because our indicators are predicting across the whole geography, it gives us lots of <laughs> lots of opportunities for testing them. Um, but I mean these are still again even though it's been a few years of refining and improving, it's a pretty broad region. So there's a kind of early days on on how we do things. Um, the other part, too, is a, a lot of it we try as much as possible to rely on, um, for, for base data sets, for indicators, uh, efforts that are already ongoing from other organizations. Uh, so the, like, for example, the, the Nature Conservancy's terrestrial resilience, um, their sort of resilient site stuff, uh, we use as sort of our resilient biodiversity hotspot metric. And so a lot of those undergo pretty extensive testing as well um, based on point level sampling. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a nice bonus. And those get improved over time. So that just got updated last year. And then we just updated the indicator to represent that. Um, so, um, but yeah, I would say in general, we don't do proactive ground treating just yet um, on indi indicators. But I do see that as things are starting to evolve that way as we as a broader partnership and the different organizations around here start kind of using and, and getting some of the benefits from indicators, uh, some of the gaps in which we could use more information. Um, we've got some folks from some organizations that actually are looking to the blueprint the indicators to identify places where they need to look <laughs> to do some ground truth things, especially some heritage folks. Um, it's one of the ways they kind of want to use the blueprint is to go actually find some places that are like, oh, here's some places where we're low on data, but there could be some stuff we need to find. Well, that's an awesome side benefit. It's great. Okay, well, um, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. I want to thank everyone for participating in the call. It's a very interactive call. I appreciate that. Um, especially thanks to Rua for taking the time and answering all of our questions today. This is really awesome for us. 
Um, as a reminder, this webinar was recorded, and we will make it available on our YouTube channel. You can access our channel from the Desert LCC website, or you can search for Desert LCC on YouTube, and you'll be able to find it there. Once again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rua, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone.